You're tuned in to RX Radio. And we're also going to do the intro in the thing. So We're going to do uh, the intro. We're doing the, the intro in the th- at the beginning. What a novel place to start. Uh, I found in my life starting at the beginning has become quite useful. Um, so I, and I listened, I've listened to more podcasts lately, not ours. I can't listen to ours. I can't Can do. You? No, what? no. Ooh, it's rough. That I have right now, and I could never open it, but in my DMs from the RX radio page, and I think it's J Marsh that posts on the RX radio page. I think so. I have about, I think it just says nine plus when you've got to so many <laughs> unread messages. So there's probably like 2,000. Where it's like, I can never open that now. Like, we all have that one person in our DMs, and for no reason other than like bad timing. But once mm. you get like four or five, I haven't opened these, there's no Hallmark card for that. You're not going back through the history of one sided communication and being like, sorry, bro, miss this. Ha ha. Uh, cry emoji. LO. Like, you can't, mm. right? You just, I, in my brain, I just, I grab some bricks and some mortar and I put a brick wall over that part of my DM and I go, that'll never be opened again. It is a mausoleum for a relationship once had. I have that with the RX radio page. (laughs) Like Jay Marshall tagged me in something and it's like, if I see it pop up on our feed because I follow the page, I'm like, hey, send that to me and I'll post it. But I I literally can't bring myself to be like, no, I know it's my voice. I know it's my voice on the other side of this fucking DM chat notification thing. And dude, I, I live with this 24 seven. There's no escape. It's like, everyone's like, oh, you rant a lot. I was like, that is the tip of the anger iceberg, my friends. <laughs> there is so much. You behind, should have been under- here a half hour before the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> For those of you listening at home, it is 6.25 p.m. Eastern on April 20th, Saturday. This will be released on Monday, the 22nd. And the podcast was supposed to schedule to start 25 minutes ago. Uh, And we've been sitting here delving beneath the depths of the tip of the exposed iceberg when it comes to the anger. We literally need to do this so that – I don't want to say that we get canceled uh, because I don't think we're that important. Sorry. But I just – so that people won't be concerned about about our health. Like I feel like I would get Mm -hmm. Baker acted really quick. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of violent references. Uh, self harm, self harm mostly. Yeah, suicide as eh, well. Homicides in there a lot. That's not yeah, a it's more homicide. It's very homicidal. Uh, which you know sometimes yeah. might be appropriate, but we won't mm. go there, or we will. I don't know. Uh, we're not going to go here on the podcast. Yeah, we're, yeah. We might go there on the evening news. <laughs> what are we, what are we gonna, oh. <laughs> But so we're going to do the intro at the beginning because we always have to go back after oh, and talk what about what we about. talked about. Right. Bring a full yeah. circle here on RX Radio. So welcome back to RX Radio. Uh, I, I mean, I, don't know, I feel like I never I, do I need to introduce ourselves? I've never done that. Yeah. I don't, if you're here, you probably know who we are. Mm, that's you a fair think? point. Right. I don't know. People stumble across. I, I did an episode last week. Uh, the intro I did last week, and I talked about the cop uh, giving me a ticket for not wearing glasses. And like someone that like, didn't follow me on Instagram hmm. hit me up and was like, oh, "I think I have a friend who's a cop in Mississauga." I was like, "How did you? How did you get here, ma'am? Like, how did you? How did you? Like, I don't. I don't understand like the podcast platforms and how people like how people hmm. choose to. I watch most of my podcasts on YouTube now, where you can also watch this podcast. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't get the discovery of podcasts. Yeah, I think people have their platforms that they kind of stay on. Like, there's definitely YouTube people. Like, I don't watch YouTube at all. Like, I don't watch anything on YouTube unless I have one specific thing that I want to see. I'll type it in, I'll watch the video, and I'll leave. But people like YouTube is their form of social media. So I'd I'd probably bet YouTube, if people are discovering us that don't know us from social media, from Instagram specifically. Yeah, it's too... I I didn't understand this relationship until – I mean I had an idea of platform allegiance as I'm more, most allegiant to Instagram. I would say that would be a safe bet for us across the board. Yeah. But then obviously – but podcasting is something that like we do. Like we're vehemently not podcasters. But we have a podcast and we've had a podcast for a while. And our podcast, not to toot our own horn, does pretty good. 
by the old views and subscribers. So shout out to everyone across all platforms that watches <laughs> this because we just recently this year moved to YouTube and I thought, well, certainly the net viewership, subscribership, listenership would stay the same. And we would just take from those that listen on Spotify and Apple Music and we would transfer those who prefer YouTube onto YouTube. But to my surprise in some ways, the Spotify and Apple audiences stayed the same and we adopted now a new audience. And this became really apparent. I was in Chicago the last couple of days and I met up with one Davey Swole. Uh, so uh, Dave's a prescript guy, young gun. And like this, uh, this is uh, Dave. I love you to death, brother. We trained at quads gym, legendary quads gym. And like, He's whatever the generation is that a 24 year old is. What is it? What is that called? Is uh, he a Gen Z? Z, 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 I think? Z yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and he's very much that. And he was telling me about kind of his, his media consumption in not so many words. He was okay. talking about a, cl a clothing company project that he's getting off the ground. And he was, you know, talking about the, his business side of things. And it was super interesting to just get some insight into what a decade what a decade before looks like now, right? Mm -hmm. Like these conver these are conversations that we couldn't have at 24, dude. Like th this, these weren't things that we could discuss. Like we, I thought of me at 24 and go, where was I? I was like, well, I was probably training with you yeah. at 24 years old, right? 10 fucking years ago, it was wild. And, I'm, and he's talking and he's talking about like a mission statement of his new company. And I'm like, fuck, this kid's switched on. And, uh, but he's talking about how he had followed a gamer on YouTube as a kid. And he's like, yeah, look, man, in high school, like I didn't really have that many friends. And it's like, yeah, fuck, that's, that's a thing. One can sympathize with that. And he's like, I followed this video game streamer on YouTube and then Twitch. And I was like, okay, like I haven't been into video games since like fucking Sega Genesis, but like I, I, I get it. I know that world a little bit here now at the outer limits of my comprehension. Right. And then he's like, yeah, this dude like was on the come up. He started streaming. And some of you might know who he is. Started streaming on um, on Twitch in a homeless shelter, which like immediately I'm old, right? So I'm just like, <laughs> get your shit together, right? Like that's where my brain goes right away. I'm like, this is not like if you, <laughs> you, you how do you have a Game Boy or whatever the fuck and are homeless? Like one of these, these don't coexist. The homeless people that I grew up with weren't streaming there's no bandwidth there's no upload speed when you were a homeless person in 1998 like that just wasn't a thing and so but i'm watching him and he's like he's really he's you know he's a, he's, he's a great speaker storyteller and um and, and he's like yeah dude like i gotta be honest like this guy i watched him stream on youtube and then with twitch and he i watched him buy his first apartment and then buy his first house all off of like the money that he had made from yeah streaming online i was like wow that's insane to me to to understand that both the ascension through the you know the socioeconomic ranks but also dave's sort of attachment friendship bond that he created with this creator and then unfortunately the the, the dude passed away committed suicide and dave was like yeah i felt like i lost a friend and i'm like that is one i mean that's terrible obviously like that's you wouldn't wish that on anyone but it's like the allegiance to the platform and just the introduction, like I, we brought this up on the show before. I remember I was in high school when I had my, got my first computer. Yeah. Right. Like I think that's still like, and I'm not that old. I was just that poor. Like I think that's, that's a good distinction. I was 15 years old when I got my first computer. Right. Like I, okay. I, I was my, my relationships with my friends that I had were formed at 15. And it's like, even at 15, I don't think, you know, creators in 2005. Yeah. I don't know. When did YouTube start? Probably before then. But like, I don't, I don't remember seeing YouTube and be, like being recognized as a thing until, yeah. I don't know, in undergrad. Yeah. I remember a bit before that. I remember there were like viral videos that would go around and like people would just be like quoting these dumb viral videos. Like, um, Don Mazzetti was one of the early ones. I remember that. I wonder if he come on the pod. Do you think he come on the pod? 
I don't know, man. You, you sent him a DM. He's tatted yeah. as fuck. Have you seen him? He yeah, went all in, dude. Yeah, for sure. But it's it's an interesting landscape now for, for kids like that that are coming out and they want to make a name for themselves because I feel like we were kind of early in the game. Like we recognize that people were having success building online fitness businesses. So we're like, all right, this is where it's headed. We need to get into this. And like you knew the Mind Pump guys. We started the podcast. Um, I had some friends that were doing like an online yoga thing that I was kind of like involved with. That I'm was like, big, Doug. That was, was big. big. Raw Mod, yeah. yeah. They were doing numbers, cool. dude. Yeah. I, dude, when low key, when you did that photo shoot, I'm like, yo, my guy's out there. He <laughs> made it, dog. He's, we're doing this. That was nuts, man. Nuts, dude. Yeah, they were, they were crushing it. And it was like cool to be peripherally involved with that and like get to see it. And then understand that, like, all right, this is this is new, but it feels like the way that things are heading. To see someone have so much success right out the gate with that, just because there's there's not much competition in the marketplace. And now the the barrier of entry is so much lower in terms of we kind of talked about this when we were in Australia on the podcast, like production value. Like there's there's a standard. Like if you don't have a 4K camera, like if you don't have a good microphone, like no one's gonna listen to you just because just because it's so easy to have those things. And on top of that, you have to have a good message. You have to have a good mission. You have to have a good business in place. Like people, like if you're getting followers, if you're getting, you know, some sort of notoriety on whatever platform you're on, like, what are you doing? Are you selling PDFs and t-shirts or do you have a business that you can grow and that you can grow with? And it's becoming a lot more competitive now. So it's, it'll be interesting to see these, these Gen Z kids, what they do to capitalize on this because we're in a place that, like us specifically, we're in a place where we've been doing this for a decade now and like we fucked it up every single way, but we had time to fuck it up because everyone else was just kind of behind the curve. Like we were fortunately ahead of the curve in what we were doing and we were able to kind of get an idea of what we were doing and how to do it before everyone was really trying to look into it. But now everyone's looking into it. Everyone wants to live that life where they have the online business and they can work from coffee shops and do whatever. But it's getting harder and harder to do because it's harder to differentiate yourself because everyone's trying to do the same thing. It's so easy to have the same production quality. And a lot of people are even saying the same thing. So it, it'll be really interesting to see what, what the next wave is. And I, yeah. I have no idea what that's going to be. I mean, I think what, what struck me as, as intriguing – in my conversation with Dave was he, the, he referenced and it's like, I don't know anyone. And it's, it's so weird. Cause like, I think yeah. I'm fairly like I used, to, I used to be the guy that goes to you and you'd be like, dog, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anyone. I was yeah. like, what are you talking to me for? So I always used to, I always felt informed right. cause I've talked to you and you're like, let me stop you right here. Who, who are you <laughs> talking about? And I'm like, Oh, okay. And I felt that way with him. And he talked about this guy and I've heard his name before. And it's like, it's it's odd to me when I admit my dissonance with mm -hmm. popular culture that mm -hmm. people are surprised. And people think I'm lying. People are like, there's no fucking way. There's no way you don't know who blah, blah, blah is. I'm like, dog. And the, like I've coined this line where I'm like, I just work on the internet. I right. don't live there. Yeah. Like I just put my shirt on and fucking my uniform with my name tag and welcome to RX Radio episode 5000 or whatever we're on right now. And then I go in live my life. <laughs> I just leave. Yeah. I go home and I check out. Now, the reason that is, one of the reasons that is, is because the business, albeit a digital business, does not necessarily solely exist on the internet, mm -hmm. right? It does at the core root of our operations as we are, you know, a multinational company with 30 staff members across the world. So, yes, obviously, the telecommunications aspect of our business is online, but it's inward facing. Mm -hmm. Our business operations, the, the, the what you guys see is www.pre-script.com and you see the L1 and you see the L2 and you hear about the L3. And then some of you come experience these things with us and you hear about the courses and you get the manuals. But like that's the easy part right that's been done like the day-to-day -day operations of business business management and then where we're at and where we've always been at really is business development that's the thing that's that's the business right that's where we spend our time and so people are always surprised because 
the company's doing well and you know it's been doing better year over year for the past eight years which has been great and it's been a blessing but the reason that i don't know who um fuck i want to say gomez but his name's not gomez he's a guy he i, I think i'm thinking of gomez and gomez the mexican food place in australia <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it knock is. off chipotle <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no he's uh he owns an apparel company and a really big gym and it's in Houston, and the gym and no, the uh, Alpha Elite, the oh, yeah, clothing yeah, yeah. company. Yeah, I've heard it's of it. It's not. It's not Gomez. Fuck, I'm gonna get crucified by fucking twinks with earrings. Like I just can't. <laughs> what is this? Do you know who I'm talking about? Though you heard the name. I, I've heard of the gym. Uh, you got? Oh yeah, we have computers. We're on yeah, computers. Let's see. Um, um, fuck, dude, I feel so oh, bad. Oh, just I don't think that's it. Uh, that's Alpha Elite owner. Alpha Christian League. Guzman, Guzman, Gomez. Yo, fair play, dog. I was right there. <laughs> yeah, you were like, close. Uh, yeah, that was sorry. Sorry, uh, but deep, my sincerest apologies to Christian, Christian Guzman, not Gomez. And I was talking, and he was like, there's no fucking way you don't know who this guy is. <laughs> Yo, like, wait, wait, wait. I, you know, you want to know why you confuse that with the spot in uh, Australia? Because it's actually called Guzman and Gomez. Okay, so yeah. I'm not far off. I'm not yeah. far off. It was a, yeah. I was association. There was an right. association there. Okay. I was just, I, actually, what we just saw was me being wrong twice is what we saw. <laughs> Class, classic. Okay. And like, so I have Google searched him now. And I can honestly say without fail, this is the first time I've ever laid eyes on this, on this gentleman. I told that to Dave. I was like, oh, um, because he had an Alpha Elite shirt on. And I keep my, my eyes are open when I'm in public in gym. So I've seen the apparel company before. Right, I'm not going to yeah. dis, I'm not going to try and, I'm not trying to be altruistic or virtuous by saying I'm old. Like I, I, I find no pride in the fact that I don't know who these people are. It's not a point of like, oh, I look at me. I'm so like, no, it's, I'm just dumb. Like let's, let's, let's always <laughs> rewind back to that fact that I'm just a dumb person. And so I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, yeah, that guy could walk in here right now. I'd have no idea who he was. And yeah. Dave was kind of like, now he knows me a little bit. He's taken L1 and L2. He's coming out to L3. And so he's like, really? Like the 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 awe that I and I and I understand. And and there's people like, you know, I remember, dude, there is still a guy that'll DM me about the episode we did about bodybuilding where you're like, who the fuck is Dorian Yates? <laughs> and like whenever I, I do I thought that was five years ago. It was five years ago. So for those of you just joining us now. Jay and I did an episode, and for whatever reason, we were talking about bodybuilding. Some of you might know Jordan actually competed. How old were you when you did that one show? I was 21 years old. So Jordan competed when he was 21 years old. And so of the two of us, he's been closer to actual bodybuilding. Now, for me, for a long time, I was more into the culture, uh, you know, the supplement co companies I was sponsored by. I was going to expos. I had a lot of friends who are and still are professional bodybuilders. But as far as I'm concerned, my metric of doing the damn thing Jay is more has a better experience because he's done it. And we did an episode years ago where I brought up the name Dorian Yates, which those of you who are bodybuilding aficionados would know who Dorian Yates are. Even now, peripheral bodybuilding fans would know. And Jay didn't know. And some random dude came into my DM and was like, "Yo, get a new get a new co-host." Get, get, I was like, "What?" Yeah. He still messages me. He still He's like, "Yo, DMs this guy me. fucking sucks." Like he'll literally like agree to a, a clip that I post. He's like, "Yeah, this guy that was right, but five Fuck. years ago he didn't know who Dorian Yates was." <laughs> so I'm like, so I find no, I find no point in pride not knowing who these people are, but. I was what what concerns me is you know what we're, I think you need to put into relative terms what a Christian Guzman is in the industry right like if I were to get into a sport yes you can have aspirations of being LeBron James but a lot of LeBron James and maybe this is a, a broader conversation to be had about life in general there is a lot of randomness I'm not going to call it luck because there's obviously a tremendous amount of hard work that goes into being that, but there's a lot of randomness that can kind of masquerade itself as, and it's good circumstance, right? It's good fortune. And there are athletes that befall bad fortune, right? Like I think of um, what's his name, Derek Rose mm -hmm. and his knee issues like that, that is one step, one other direction. You don't fall on a guy's ankle. I think he had ankle and knee issues uh, uh, chronically that really put a damper on a career. And there's a lot of athletes like that. Yeah. So it's like there is a there's an element of 
you know, attainability now where you can see these stories of PTs who create content. Cause that's what I'm assuming. I think if I memory serves me correctly, that is how uh, this Christian, uh, sorry, that this Christian guy sounds wrong. This is how Christian Guzman, if I'm not mistaken, built his brand. And, but that, and this is no fault of him, but to pick up that aspiration and to be like, I'm going to bet the farm on this. It's like, I almost feel like my dad kind of having the, the not so direct conversation with me about like, Hey, you're kind of a mediocre, okay, junior hockey player, but have you thought about, you know, the rest of your life? <laughs> yeah. And then being like, now looking back and be like, thanks, Pops, appreciate you. Like, you know, it, I know what it takes to get to the league peripherally through watching and working with kids who've gotten to the NHL. And I'm like, yo, no chance. Like, not even. <laughs> I was lucky to play the level I played, knowing what I know now. And it's, you know, and I think a lot of people see that aspirational story because you don't see that aspirational story in pro sports. You understand the anomaly that is, you know, the, the Odell Beckham juniors, you understand the anomalies that are LeBron James, right? You would be ill-advised and, and if anyone cared about you, you would probably be advised against setting your hopes against, unless of course you're. I don't know, you're uh, the next prodigy that's on the news. The thing is, when you're in social media, fitness land, in your mind, you're on the news all day. <laughs> to, to quote William Shakespeare, all the world's a stage for you. And, and I think it just really gives, it just gives an interesting perspective because I don't know how many slots are available at the top. But, but and this is the big, this is the big not so rain on everyone's parade thing. If you focus on developing a business, even if you don't land amongst, you know, the 1% of the 1%, which I'm sure this Christian, but I'm sure Christian Guzman is in the industry with, you know, his gym is, I'm to understand, quite massive and his apparel company is prolific enough for me to have seen it and be like, oh yeah, that's, I noticed that. Uh, now he's, he's clearly has business savvy to have scaled the way he has, but I still think it's like, as much as you want to focus on the aspirational story, if you need equal or more, especially this day and age, to focus on the nuts and bolts of business development. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you can still make like, I don't know, man, what's a comfortable lifestyle? For? You can still make six figures. If you make six figures Easily. in continental North America, like you're doing great. Look at other jobs. And this is what's crazy to me is people, they, they just don't break down hourly. When you're in fitness, you like don't really know how the rest of the world gets paid. Yeah. Which is like wild to me. Like, I don't know. When I was a kid, the idea and, you know, factoring in inflation, all that, the idea of making like $55 an hour was like, holy shit. Like, I think at the, at the time you were probably a physician if you made $55 an hour. Like, what, what's the back of the napkin math on like 55 bucks an hour by 40, 55 by 40 a week times four? Uh, you're making eight, eight grand a month times 12. Yeah. 105 G's yeah. like that was. And back when I was a kid, you could buy a house for fucking $115,000. So it's like, you know, you got your mortgage, not obviously mortgage paid off in a year, but like you're doing well at 55 bucks an hour today. People like scoff at that. Like, dude, that's still an aspirational wage in the real world. Now your options are, and I feel like this is a lot of care. And now talking to Dave, like he's, you know, he's business minded. He has a plan. And I reinforced in conversation the importance of that plan. But like, I know a lot of kids that are like the, the formula on the whiteboard in their like office in their parents' house must be like YouTube plus <laughs> 6 percent body fat equals and then like a bunch of zeros after a one i'm like dude that trust me like trust me trust me that ain't it but if you knocked a few of those zeros down and were realistic and you were willing to work at it for 10 years and what i work at it i mean work on the things that aren't on the internet right at the outward facing of the internet and build a business yes yes you can you can make a very comfortable lifestyle that affords you a ton of freedom per se also a ton of responsibility and I think the thing that gets lost is people just want the freedom. It's yeah. like that comes and not to be too, 
metaphysical, but that comes at a price. And that price is responsibility. Yeah, and if that, you, it's your responsibility to develop a business. I agree. Yeah. And even I actually had a very similar conversation this week about hourly rates and the opportunity that there is in being an online coach right now, because it's, there's so little governance over it so that anyone can do it. And especially if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably in the fitness industry enough where you could probably do it. And if you break it down by an hourly rate, it's all about the business that you build and the systems that you have in place. We know plenty of people that have a ton of clients and the more efficient you can be in servicing your clients and do so while still continuing to do it at a high value to them. Average coaching prices for an online coach, I'd say low end 200, maybe not even the high end, but like two to 400 is probably average in the United States, in North America. People check in with their clients once a week, takes 15 minutes. If you do the rough math on that, you're making two to $400 an hour. So if you have the initiative and the systems in place and you work on your business, you don't, you don't need a huge following. You don't need millions of followers. You don't need to be these people getting brand deals and sponsorships. If you can work and you're responsible and you can add value and you give a shit about what you do, you have 40, client, 40 clients at $300 an hour. What's that? That's 12 grand a month easy so it's it's very obtainable it's very tangible you just need to look at the opportunity that's posed to you and like that's what the internet is that's what social media is you can build a business that's going to be a great business for you and if you have the mind and the freedom that you have created for yourself to not just service your clients but also work on the business then you can start to scale that and you can build yourself a really lucrative business just by being good at what you're doing, having that responsibility, having good systems in place, and you don't need a huge following. You just need to understand that these people, the you have access to, if you have an Instagram business account, it tells you how many people see your account every single month. Like maybe it's tens of thousands of people. Maybe it's hundreds of thousands of people. That's all potential customers. They're people that are somewhat at least peripherally interested in what you have to say. So if you can capitalize on that and you can take initiative, then there's so much potential in this. There's so much potential. And it doesn't have to be think, you know, the, pe- the people we know their names. Well, I just think if you're, if you're worried about content, you're ne- you'll never get there. You'll never get there. Like I, I think if the if if you hire and look, I don't know, I don't know what business coaches do. This is, this is our experience. This is not to to, to right. paraphrase Kyle Mackey. This is not medical advice. This is not business advice. This is just two guys who have gone through it, and I, I'm concerned, putting it nicely, about business coaches and their first point of advice counsel is about content creation. If you're, if the first thing, if the first couple of calls and look, do whatever. And I disclaim this one, I'm an idiot. Mm. Right. Got that out of of, of the way. You should be well aware. That's like been around this podcast. That's like giving someone advice. And then at the end saying, but what do I know? Yes. No, but at the end of the day, it's like, look, I just disclaim that. So people don't think I'm telling them and and to do anything. Cause in a weird way, people like, I, I Ricky Gervais did this joke once. I saw him at Sony Theater in Los Angeles, and I like I spent every last dime I had at the time to like. Uh, I think I had to rent a car to drive to LA because the vehicle I owned wasn't trustworthy enough to drive to Los Angeles from San Francisco and back. And I go, spent my last red cent on going to see him, and he had a joke about like comments on the internet, and it's just like imagine putting up like a free guitar lesson thing with like a phone number and a little cut pieces with the phone so you're like walking through the park you see it stapled to a tree like oh free guitar lessons and imagine like taking that and then going home and calling the person and then yelling at them like fuck you you suck at guitar like what (laughs) so it's like i'm so tired of that like there's this one fucking guy and not to go on a tangent there's this guy who like i'll put up a post about something and this is business advice this this particular business is because it's just don't respond to trolls. There's this guy, and I'm not going to give him any more airtime. I don't delete his comments. I just let other people just go like 
dude, are you stupid? And he negatively comments on every – I think he has notifications on. Like he's the first in every single time. Oh, and my God, my advice to people is, like, dude, he's the worst because he, he's fundamentally wrong. Like homeboy, mm-hmm. I've been doing this. Like trust me. You yeah. Trust me with the stuff I'm putting out. Like I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I'm onto something. Like you run a small PT gym in – I'm not even going to say the country because he's going to give it away and I don't want to give this guy any credit. But if you guys go on to my post, there's a guy who's just like consistently shit talking to you. You just look dumb. So I want to avoid backlash because I just don't have the bandwidth to like introduce that into my life. If your business coach's first thing is taking a look at your social media, so that's not business. That's not. And it's right. look, the, there is a, and you said this to me, I actually quoted you the other day. And I thought it was the the day we released the L three, and uh, I, I was I was I was, I was in Chicago, and I, I said, <sighs> I remember Jordan saying way back in reference to you, and you were talking about what your father had told you, and he's like, you don't have a business until you make money when you sleep, and that stuck with me for ten years. We've been in business because some days I feel like we have a job we made for ourselves. And that's, yeah. that's something that I fight against day in and day out because we both work extremely hard, extremely long hours in the business. But there are days where we put courses for sale and you know, with a level three, especially like there's a lot of excitement around it and, and rightfully so. And I don't usually sleep those nights that goes up for sale. And then I get like this, re- this slight lightning bolt of reassurance. It's like, oh, I woke up and they're okay. And I think about what you told me. A- and when I, I tell that to people, to coaches because it's like, look, it's okay. And Bax did a really good podcast on this on RX where he was on a few months back. I would definitely suggest go listen to it. It's okay to have a, have a job for yourself, right? Especially if you're a coach, you're in the service industry. But if you ever want a business, businesses are systems fundamentally, right? And if you are hiring a business, if you want to hire a job coach for the job you have for yourself, then sure, the job coach might be like, hey, create content. A business coach should be talking to you about systems, right? And whether it's even just improving the deployment of your service, like you had talked about, like, can we make the check-in process more efficient? But if we know we are hogtied to, as someone who exists in the service industry, trading time for money, can we maximize the amount of money we can trade for per unit time? Uh, and I just see this behavior and it's so misguided and chasing the wrong metric. It's like, if you build systems, you can actually build a business from a service or a job you create for yourself. So I would advise if you are even, and I would say even, but like, you know, coaching has a very forward facing, you have to be there job aspect to it. You can begin to scale that into something that looks more like a business or has elements to it that look more like yeah. a business rather than a job you have for yourself. I think one of the fundamental things about that is breaking the way that you think of the relationship between time and money, right? Which, which is pretty much what you were saying. But I, I think people think in the term of dollars per hour, right? Or this is my salary to work 40 hours per week. And especially coming from a lot of the people that we're talking to or that are in this space are coming from personal training where my rate is X amount of dollars per hour. Until you can break that relationship, it's not a business, right? It, it should be, I'm going to do this work to build this system that will continually run and create money or create some sort of revenue so that I can build the next thing and build the next thing. If you always have to have touch points on these things, or if it's something that, which we talk about a lot, if you can't hand off to someone that's not you, then you're not building business systems. You're creating a job for yourself and you're creating multiple jobs. So it's not about creating more work for yourself and it shouldn't be more work equals more money. It's more systems equals more money. So if these systems can work without you, then that's a business. If these systems need you, then that's a job. Yeah. I think a lot of that is understanding leverage. Like we yeah. all have, yeah. and I, I forget who I was talking to the, uh, the other day, but uh, I think it was Hattie Boydell. Yeah. Hattie's episode, I believe is going to release this week. And we, I was talking to her cause she's, she's run and developed a business, not just like jobs for herself. She had sports model projects. She's got uh, the new flex coaching. And it's when I think about that, I think about, and it's been going around Instagram lately. And it's something that I think I've adopted passively, but it's people trade, um, 
and I, I don't want to use rich and poor, although the meme says rich and poor, and I don't necessarily agree with it because I know a bunch, bunch of rich people that do this. And it says poor people save money and to spend time or take time for things that take time and rich people uh, spend money to save time. Hmm. If you can understand the, the paradox there, I, I worded that properly. And what I got away from that. So basically it's someone who is, and, and I don't like the, the axiom of rich and poor because I don't think it's necessarily definitive across socioeconomic lines. But the idea is there are people out there who will save their money to do things that take them more time. And this is, I think it has a lot to do with what you were talking about, the relationship that you have with money and time where, you know, in this, in this meme, it was quite literally what it was. The, <laughs> the rich person is spending their money to buy back their time. And what I think the principle and I, to, to loop it back in with Hattie, which I, I, we talked about on the podcast and I think she had done really well is, is understanding leverage. Like leverage is the interest to me, leverage is the intersection between who you are and what you do. That's when I think of leverage, that's ultimately I think about, especially in our industry. Now, leverage has a lot of like Epstein had leverage. Like what did, it, what did that mean? He probably had a, you know, Stephen Hawkins diddling or whatever the fuck that stupid story was. <laughs> There's leverage comes in many forms. But I think in our industry, when I think about leverage, I think about the intersectionality of being a good coach and insert thing about your life right so with hattie it was like okay she was a good coach and a champ world champion fitness model right or if we can you can draw this in any any direction it's like it doesn't have to just be that it can be a, a personality trait like macintosh is a great coach and he's the most likable person on the planet to people who like right. him and he's probably the least likable to people he doesn't like but like it's it, it's people. about Yes, yes, to death. And, but so it's like when I think about that in the early stages and I think about the concept of leverage, I think that coaches, as long as you have a value set and you're not like you're reaching outside your means, you're not doing stuff just for like the sake of content creation, you're not like shit posting if it's not like authentic to your values, whatever, whatever. I think that like if you can figure out what about you and your lived experience when mixed with coaching, gives you the greatest amount of leverage, that is the thing that you exploit, right? That is, Beautiful. so we have friends of ours who are in the military, right? Or who are former military. They are, they are war veterans in the United States Army or Navy or Air Force, whatever. And I think, wow, what an opportunity. I think of a guy named Peter, Peter Jaw, Peter J. Law, Peter J. Law. I think that's his, I think I said Jaw. He's, uh, I, I follow him on Instagram. A, a U.S. war veteran, and I think about oh, I've watched him develop his social media, and I'm going to pull it up as to not, um, as as to not, uh, you know, give a give a disservice. Peter, yeah, Peter J Law. So Peter J Law underscore on Instagram, and I've watched him weave in his his i think it's marine corps us marine corps story into his training as a coach and i think leverage fuck yeah right what did we do we're at, we yeah we love coach we we're barbell lifters we we're strength athletes but we were also chiropractors we leaned in on that hard that was our biggest point of leverage now it's not really it now it might be more like we work with pro athletes that's our leverage right it's the it's the you're a coach and and whatever that is as long as it's like authentic to your values you need to exploit that thing. If it's something you're interested in, it's some, if it's fucking anime, I really like anime. You're the coach that also likes anime. Yeah. Okay, it's cool. Like, because you talked about, you know, it all, we're in an industry now that is, is, is more saturated than it has been and probably less saturated than it ever will be. Right. You said something profound to me. I quote, I quote you a lot, dog. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you, brother. <laughs> but here's the funny thing. You're going to laugh at the quote that I want to quote you now. We, we were in Sydney. You gave me one of the most profound answers to a question that I ever heard while you were not on this planet. Sure, your feet were on the ground. You were on the sidewalk. But we were so high in public. <laughs> but you gave – okay. So I'm going to give a bit of backstory because this episode is clearly – we were going to talk about supplements today. And yeah. here we are. So supplementing 39. with LSD. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I'm just going to tell the story. 
And it, I just have to tell it so it's out in there. So we're in Melbourne in January. And we were with our good friend, James McIntosh, uh, brother, you know, just you can't, I can't, nothing warms my heart like talking to Mac. Like he's just, I could cry sitting here, the thought of that man. It's just, you just like, I'm welling up just thinking about it. Mac, love you to death. Yeah, and we don't get this, we don't get to see our brother Mac very often. And when we do, it's a celebration. And you know how we like to celebrate at Prescript? With hallucinogenic drugs. <laughs> So I'm just gonna tell the whole story. So we're go in. We're we're in. I'm in Melbourne. I have a few connections. I competed there a lot at the Arnold's, the city I spent some time in. So I know some people, and I know some people who are like relatively unsavory. Let's say people who can get things. We got a couple days notice. There's a couple cool things that would be fun on drugs. And Mac, being a you know a resident of Australia, native South South African, if you ever need South Africans can find shit. So. We're sitting around I'm like, all right, yo, let's let's go to the moon. Let's, you know, we we don't get to spend much time together. I think it was the t maybe the tail end of our trip as well. Let's, you know, let's do a proper send off. So I start sending some feelers out, some text messages to people who I am known to get things. And I was like, hey, you know, mushrooms, I think, were the original goal. And so I sent like four or five text messages, WhatsApp messages, Wicker, Flickr, whatever the fuck, encrypted bullshit. Like, oh, I'll never find you on this thing. Sure, whatever. And I'm like, I hit up a few people. And I was like, hey, you know, uh, huge favor, short notice, no worries. If not, looking to get some shrooms, anything you can do. And a couple of people write, wait, wait, ah, mate, like they're out of season, which I thought, what a stupid Australian drug dealer answer to get. North America, it's always money season in North America. Your drug dealer's got all seasons. He's like a good pair of tires. He's all season. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, for fuck's sake. So Mac is on the hunt. <laughs> and we sit there. And so I'm like, oh, fuck, so-and-so can't get him. The other person can't get him. I got a few more. And, I, and Mac looks at me and goes, so? And he's got like this, like, everyone stop what they're doing. We need to talk. Look at their face. I was like, what is this guy talking about? So we can't get mushrooms. And I'm like, oh, boy. And I was like, well, there's a butt coming, obviously. And he kind of goes, and then he goes, he looks his dad in the face somehow simultaneously at the same time. He goes, but this person can get cracked. I don't, there was... There, <laughs> there, was too, there was too long of a pause before we shut it down. It was too long, bro. You know it was too long. It was way too long, dude. <laughs> like, we, we were running through scenarios in our head. Like, like Collectively, we just all saw like the thought bubbles. Just like We all looked up, and the little thought bubble came in red. And then immediately, it was just like us on the sidewalk like doing what crackheads do. We're like, maybe we should keep looking. Yeah. And it was like days later where we're like, yo. We almost <laughs> smoke crack, dog. That was... <laughs> Anyways, we ended up we ended up buying in bulk. I think we ended up what we got an ounce of shrooms, which is like a fucking what, twenty-four like, grams or something yeah, like that. I think it's like thirty or thirty-two, Fuck. maybe. More than a human should need. But we're like, all right, whatever. We're, this guy's doing us a solid. We'll drop a bit extra coin. We won't if we don't finish it, we don't finish it. And then someone hits me back and I forgot to message this person, be like, oh hey, we're actually we're Gucci, like we're good on the drug. And he goes, hey, mate, got uh, couldn't get shrooms, but I got you 10 hits of acid. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be rude. <laughs> so we procure the absurd amount of drugs that we're about to take and take them. <laughs> and I remember walking down the sidewalk, and it's something that'll stick with me forever. And you're like, we're just – everything's a cartoon. It's – I don't know. Like, look, I'm not sitting here saying drugs are one, one way or another. I remember being on this podcast years ago and actually being like, I don't like when podcasters talk about drugs. So I apologize for the hypocrisy. And I just remember looking at you like, yo, Jay, like how many shrooms do we got left? And you're like, and you're just struggling. Like you're trying to do the math in your head. And I was like, how is this guy even functioning? Like every, everything was just like, I'm just melting in the background. It was just an oil painting that was moving. And you look at me and you go, and after like really thinking it, like really like scratching the old noggin and going less than an ounce but more than none. And you just kept walking. I was like, that was <laughs> profound. That was the most, I've used that in so many contexts. It's like, oh man. So yes, why did I bring that up? I'm not even sure, but the essence of that stuck with me. And I don't know why we went down that rabbit hole. Yeah, How I have does no that fucking idea. How does that relate to business? Uh, leverage. We're talking <laughs> about leverage. So when you're dealing with optimizing your current business situation. I think the intersectionality of where you're at 
and or as a coach and who you are as a person is your greatest point of leverage, right? And I think when you you always need to be on the lookout. And I think this is where people get stuck. This is where business development and personal development, I think, have some overlap is if you find yourself encapsulating the version of yourself in your business, you actually stifle the ability of you as a person to grow. And I don't think that it, and look, I'm not like, there is a weird, I don't know him personally. I know some friends who are close to him. He is, he is the most influential person in business without a doubt in our industry, Alec Formosi. Yeah. And he has a certain ethos and look, it's, it's, it's inter the interesting thing about business is that it follows the tenets that I would like training to almost follow. Like, Hey, everyone, li everyone listens to the richest guy in business, which <laughs> I love, which I love that. And I, 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 I enjoy consuming that, but in fitness, there are people who just listen to fucking blobs, which is like, imagine listening to the poorest guy about business. So there's a, there's an essence to the character of Alex. Ram and I don't want to say character to be disparaging the, 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 the account of Alex Ramosi that I find endearing. Cause it's like, he, uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at his PLs. I just assume he's doing as well as he says he's doing. Cause I have no reason to believe that he's not I public record of the companies he sold. He's definitely in probably the nine figures, if I'm not mistaken. And I think he's making a run at a billion as like his goal. But I, I look at someone like that and I, and I, there are plenty of ways to be successful in business, business but it seems to be like a, a trend towards like, well, how does he think about business? Because he's quite agnostic from what I've seen. And I don't I haven't dug into this, but I think personal development and business development can too oftentimes, and he pushes back against this, run too hand in hand. But I think just like if you look at the Forbes 500 companies, I forget the statistics, but it's something like only a marginal percent of Forbes 500 companies last longer than like 25 years or something like that. Which is like, how do you go from being, you know, on a list of the largest earning companies on the planet and then within a generation go to dust? And a lot of times there is this continuum of companies start off innovative and liberal and progressive and forward thinking. And by nature of building a business, you become more conservative. What I've seen in our space is I've seen that swing of conservatism, if you will be manifested through an inability for that sole creator to evolve. Companies have different CEOs, which will drive different visions of the company. And, you know, Apple, for example, if you guys are familiar with Apple story, right? You had Steve Jobs, now you have Tim Cook, very diametrically opposed in their disposition and their vision for the company, but allows for the evolution of Apple. Certainly if Steve Jobs was at the helm now, it probably wouldn't be as successful, who knows? But companies do this deliberately. They have a board of directors. They understand that in a conservative, monolithic company like Apple, which I'm, you know, it's probably one or two next to Amazon and the largest liquid asset companies on the planet, they understand the need for innovation. Now, I think there's an inherent understanding of this being in technology and in technology being a progressive field of its own. Fitness is not that progressive per se. And I think what I see happen and people where they where they don't understand leverage is leverage is something you need to consistently be looking out for right leverage is something where like hey if i offer a service i need to make sure that if i am the service and i am the brand that i don't just get i see people's personality get trapped in their business because it's something that made them money once and it stops them right. from making money long term because they <clears throat> themselves are limiting their ability to grow as a person because they don't want to grow out of the thing that is currently giving them success. Not realizing that the thing that they go, that they love to do or are like picking up a, a hobby or something new is the thing that's going to be their next stepping stone. That is going to be your next point of leverage. I think of a gentleman named John Shared. John runs a gym in Canberra, Australia called Burley Strength. John used to be a geared powerlifter, multi single ply powerlifter in Australia. You know, big powerlifter, big beard. And John has evolved as a person over time. And I've known him from the tail end of his powerlifting days into now. He's a close friend. John likes going for bike rides and listening to Tool and, you know, being more fit. And he's ad adopted that. And wouldn't you know his business as a byproduct of understanding that intersection of new John and the service that John provides 
That's his point of leverage that's continued to grow his business. Burley's doing great and John's doing great. And you're not doing great if both aren't doing great. As I see people like just, they just get stuck in like, this yeah. piece of content did really well. I am a bodybuilder. I need to keep doing check-in until you're 80 years old. It's like, dude, leverage is the intersection between who you are and what you offer. And if you figure that out and you lean into that and you stay attuned to who you are as you evolve, and if you don't, you should probably talk to someone that's not just me and you on a podcast. That is, in I think, our industry, the most untapped relationship that people miss out on. And it's where people get, they cast themselves in amber like the fucking mosquito. And if you do an autopsy on the Jurassic Park mosquito, you realize that, oh, you're just this person in this phase of their life forever. And it's like, no one wants, it's not an attractive thing for people to, 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 to latch onto. It's not, it's not a good brand strategy as a person who provides a service. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And I think a, an important point to pull from that is your leverage is your experience, right? It's no one can take that from you. No one can fake that. Like if you're faking out that it's going to come out, it's going to be exposed at some point, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this grand thing. You don't have to be, you know, special forces or you don't have to be the geared power lifter, but someone that comes to mind with this that does well for themselves. And is one of my favorite people as well is Eric Baguera, right? His, his leverage is he's really good and he'll openly talk about this all the time. He's really good at training gen pop people which there's an incredible demand for because there's always going to be more of those people than there will be anyone else in the fitness industry, right? That's, that's your biggest market right there. So he's taking his experience and he's leveraging that and doubling down on that is that, no, this is what I do. I don't need to be the bodybuilding specific coach. I don't need to be the powerlifting coach. These are my people. And the evolution of that can be an evolution of your business or the way that you approach things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go from powerlifting to bike riding to whatever else it is to boomer fitness at some point. But if you can double down on this is what I'm good at and you can continue to grow and expand on that yourself with your personal development and a lot of times that's going to be what helps you to build the systems that allow you to have the personal development. Is that if I'm really good at this, that's the separation of, okay, this is where I'm going to double down. This is where I need to learn how to maximize my time here. So you separate dollars per hour or time per unit money. And then from there, it gives you the freedom to do the things that allow you to develop personally. Like the Garrett just had a kid. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't even know if I support it, but I love him. <laughs> but like that's personal development. And now with that, he's going to be able to pull from that experience because there's a huge market for general population people who have just had a kid and need to keep training or want to keep training. And now he has experience where he could speak to that audience. So it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to be the hormozy or you don't have to be this, you know, it doesn't have to be this grand experience that you have like you don't have to have served in iraq to be able to exploit your experience but you just need to understand and be honest with yourself that this is my experience and this is the market that i can best serve and then talk to that market like there's people that their content creation is is it's completely dissonant from the service that they offer or they're creating content because of something. And I see this all the time is you'll see people that they'll have something that'll like pop off and go viral. And then, like you said, that becomes their entire identity because the internet's telling them who they are as opposed to them telling the internet who they are. So it really comes down to just being true to yourself and relying on your experience and the wisdom that you've built for yourself and then exploiting that. And I think, so I had this conversation with a friend the other day and I, we talked about your, you kind of let off with trading time for money and changing a relationship with time and money. And I think experience is such an interesting interjection into that equation. And I have this, I have this theory about time and experience. And I know what you're thinking, man, these guys must do a lot of acid. <laughs> and that's not entirely true. But yeah, I, was thinking, I was trying to explain this the other day. And I, and I, you know, I am a huge advocate for the, the axiom of uh, you know, do it for the experience, don't do it for the credit. Right, like, they don't do it for the money. Don't do it for the credit. Don't do it for the accolades. Don't do it for the pat on the back. Don't do it for the likes, the followers, or anything. Do it for the experience. I think, and this is where I and I try to explain this to coaches who have trepidation around their experience in the industry, but don't understand what experience is. 
And this is like kind of how I think about it. Have you ever heard about drug cartel members that used to weigh their money by yeah. like the truckloads? Yeah. And it's like, it's, well, it's we easy kind of counting. Add, yeah. It's easy. But so here's the thing. I think there's so much opportunity for experience that we we use a different measure for the qua- the qualitative or the quantitative aspect of experience and we just call it time. And it's like yeah. just like we have like, hey, look. You know, because I'm 34, you're, we're 34 in like like a fucking month or so. Yeah. We feel old because we've done a lot. We've experienced right. a lot. And we're just, look, across the board, and this is, you can take this back to the, like, whatever source you think, we are just vessels of experience. That's all we're here for. Just take it all in. This podcast, the sitting in traffic, whatever, that's the whole game. We just have so many opportunities for experience that we don't use the same measurement. Like you, when you have a truckload full of 20s, we use kilograms to measure it, but that's not the denomination in the truck. We use time to measure it, but that's not the denomination in the vessel. The vessel is about experience. Now, I'm not going to tell you how many grams of drugs it took to arrive at that conclusion, but I think about that so often because I, people undervalue themselves as people who serve other people by just looking at the time they've been in the industry. Not the amount of experiences and not even just experience per se, which might be the you know, denominational specific as far as like, or domain specific is probably a better way to word it. Like, oh, I've only been coaching for a few years. Doug, you were, you were a, 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 a sergeant in the Afghanistan war. Like your experience in leadership is probably world class. And what do you think you do for your clients other than prescribing zeros? You're in a leadership position. Right. So your experience, because you look at this stupid measurement, I want to know how much money, right? El Chapo's got. I don't want to know how much weight is in the truck. I need to know how much cash is on hand. That's the experience, but we measure it with time. And people are too busy going, ah, it's a little light. I was like, dog, you got gold, you got gold bars in there, you got crypto, you got Bitcoin or whatever the fuck. Like there's a there's a value to that that people they don't underwrite their experience and i mean the word underwrite quite deliberately or uh specifically because they just are weighing out their experiences by time it's like that's not how it works dog that's not how that's not how money works we don't weigh it by kilogram when we ha- hand it into the cashier we don't put our money on the fucking banana scale right they go how much money do you actually have and it's like that's the same thing with time and experience how about that for a thought hmm? love it dude fuck man yeah Spent a lot of time by myself, <laughs> but that is leverage, and yeah. you, people need to start respecting their experience that they've they had, the experiences that they've had outside of just measuring the wrong unit because it's easy. Yeah. Don't measure the unit of time. Don't weigh the cash truck out. Sit there and flip through the fucking bills and be like, "Yo, we're loaded here, dog." Not like, "Hey, this is a heavy weight to carry." Yeah. Yeah, people have these preconceived notions of this is how things work. And the more you could challenge those, the more you can exploit the the things that you've actually done and understand that there's there doesn't have to be this relationship. It's not linear, right? If if you can leverage something that you've done, like a good example is our, our level three coaches, right? They come in, they work with athletes that are going to the NFL draft what this week. And like that's an experience. That's a fucking experience that is going to put you light years ahead of people that are just in the gym, just filling out their schedule, doing the same workout with clients from 6 a.m. till 6 p.m., right? It's in one week's time, you can have the experience of working at the highest level with the highest level athletes in a high pressure environment. That's something that it doesn't matter the time you've been there, you've done it. Now understand how to leverage that properly. So I I really like that thought. And I like the idea of, of, breaking these relationships of things that are too commonly associated, but don't ne- shouldn't necessarily be associated. I think, boom, we're going to mic drop it there. That was, we're going to, we're going to leave that. We'll probably run this back, this, this concept of bit, because it's where we had a round table discussion at the first L3 about business. Yeah. And I think that was one of the big takeaways, a lot of the trepidation. And I think what the experience, and we've seen this since as people have made moves, like I know Veronica is she's working with a, 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 a professional women's hockey team. She's like interviewing at a college. I wrote a letter of reference for her the other day. But it's like, it's understanding. And I think Killian did a really good job of this in the second class. Like understand the experience. The, learning is just stuff you memorize until you do it, right? right? Yeah. Like, like that is learning doesn't happen until you experience it. So you can sit down and learn. All you're doing is memorizing. That's all, mem- it's all memorization. 
until you do it, then that's experience. That's knowledge, right? Yeah. That's so we'll, we'll wrap there. I, we'll probably run this back guys. Uh, Prescript level one course is up for sale. So I had this question a lot. Maybe if anyone's still listening, we'll kind of walk it through. Prescript <laughs> level one starts May 27th. It'll make you eligible for an L2 class. I want to say by September. So, and then that will then make you eligible for our L3 class in January. So some people are like really curious at how the track goes. If they start now, when can they get hands on and get to that level three experience? If you sign up for this current class, which is starting on May 27th, uh, you will be eligible for the second or the, sorry, the third semester of L2 this year, which will then put you in line for the January L3. So if you're currently in L1, the next L2 will be going out in June and September, if memory serves, and which will either will one of those will make you eligible for the L3. If you're currently in the L2 and trying to get into the L3, we are sending, or we have already sent out registration. The first class in the second last week of June has sold out. There are limited spots available. If you're hearing this and you didn't, for whatever reason, get the invite email, do shoot us an email, info at pre-script.com. If there are seats available, we will uh, send you the registration link. If there are not, we will make sure that your email is uh, in our list for the January L3. Did we do it? I think we did it. Nailed it. All right. RX Radio out. Appreciate it. Appreciate you guys.